So uh, take it away. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. This is uh, not really my community. So uh, let me just say that this is a short presentation of a paper just published last week, and there's more details in the paper. Um, I also figured I should probably introduce myself. So, uh, you know, floating point and numerics is not really what I do. Uh, most of what I do, my day job is basically on the hardware software stack for parallelism and a few other things, but I have a skunkworks project um, that looks at floating point. And this basically has three aspects to it. One is uh, basically studying the users, by which we mean the developers. So there's there are these papers. I put these in the, uh, in the chat as well. Um, and then uh, there's a systems-based approach, which essentially sort of says, what can we do from the perspective, say, of an operating system or whatnot to, to uh, spy on or change the behavior of floating point arithmetic? Um, and then the, the last uh, aspect here is, uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, so uh, the paper uh, does this in a nutshell, right? So it basically tries to make a case for floating point virtualization and define it. Um, it analyzes four different approaches that we have taken to try to achieve this, talks about a specific implementation, uh, FPVM, um, that we've built for x86, which I'm going to talk about more. It analyzes it, it, it discusses software and hardware approaches. There's no way all this can fit in one talk. So what this talk mostly is going to focus on is the prototype, right? Just give me an idea of this sort of flavor of work. So before I dive into the prototype, I should tell you like what is, what is floating point virtualization? What is the goal, right? So the idea is to basically be able to have this component that we can slide underneath an existing unmodified application binary um, as easily as we might add a virtual machine monitor below an operating system um, and have it essentially change the floating point arithmetic that's happening in that binary to use an alternative arithmetic system, right? Um, and make it so that and this is the systems part, make it so the overhead um, of doing this is limited by the alternative arithmetic system, not a, from virtualization itself. And you know, just to be clear, this is a towards paper. We have not achieved three, we're, on, we're in progress. So in the paper, we consider various approaches. Uh, I don't have time to go into these, but there are different trade-off points in the space. Um, and what I'm mostly gonna talk, talk about is trap and emulate. Or this exclusive that I'm going to talk about, which is basically how a traditional virtual machine monitor works as well. So one thing that we have to do in all these approaches, um, and in, in the approach I'm going to describe, um, is we have to basically maintain data flow. So in the original binary program, you have these 20 foot numbers that are flowing through registers, through memory locations, et cetera. And we want to replace these with alternative numbers in some, in some instances, right? So we need to have pointers to those alternative numbers. And what we do to, to achieve this, is we stash them um, in the original floating point numbers flowing through the binary um, using NAND boxing, which is a technique you may be familiar with from tools like JavaScript engines or whatnot. But essentially, because there are so many representations of NANDs, we can essentially steal, steal NANDs to basically represent pointers. So to do virtualization, we also need a way of uh, basically exiting to the virtual machine monitor. Uh, and what we do here is we hijack the fact that there's some implementations of IEEE floating points, such as on x86, trap when an instruction, you can instruct it to trap when, when an exception happens um, within a context of some instruction, such as these exceptions noted here, right? These are the six standard or five standard exceptions defined in the IEEE standard. So what we're going to do is we're going to, when we see one of these trapped instructions, we're going to emulate it. So just to describe in a little bit more detail how this will work or how this works, uh, there's basically three cases. So one case is that we aren't involved, involved at all, right? And here the idea is you have a floating point instruction. Um, it has non-NAN input operands, and it can produce an exact result. In this case, the hardware does not produce a trap. And there, we, the instruction executes at full speed, there is zero overhead. And just to be clear here about what I mean by instruction, so we work at the, this level, that these crazy instructions that x86 has in its five different instruction sets for floating point um, that, that, that actually implement floating point primitives, right? So these are the things that, that we're talking about here. So notice that that's language independent. And also notice that, uh, again, 
if there is no trap, if there, we have an exact representation, there's no overhead involved here. So the second case that can happen is when we have ordinary operands going into a floating point instruction and the floating point instruction cannot, uh, cannot store the results or cannot, cannot produce an exact result, right? So this produces an inexact trap. And what we're gonna do in our system is we're going to go and grab the instruction, decode it, bind the operands, promote every input operand into the alternative number system, um, execute the instruction, emulate it using the alternative number system, encode pointers to the result back into the output operands of the instruction, whether they're registers or memory or what have you. And so as a result, the floating point instructions original results are squelched, right? And they're replaced by NAND box encoded pointers to the alternative number system. Now these pointers, these NAND box pointers can then become an input to a different instruction, right? So now imagine we have input operands that include a NAND, they go into a floating point instruction. What they're gonna do is they're gonna cause in our, in our setup, they're gonna cause an invalid trap. And that is again, gonna invoke FPVM, which is going to do a, a pretty much the same thing that I just described in the previous slide, except now it will also decode the NAND input operands back to the alternative number system, okay? So these are three, the three common scenarios. So sadly, it's not that simple. Um, so the problem is that the x86 or x64 floating point hardware is not entirely virtualizable in the, sen the classic sense of Popek and Goldberg. Um, so in particular, there are some instructions that will not trap when we need them to trap, right? In order to get around this, we do a static binary analysis. This is extremely costly of the executable. And we insert for every place where such an instruction, for, for every place where a NAND box value could flow that we, can, that we are not gonna be able to detect dynamically, we introduce a special instruction called a correctness trap to invoke us on, on that situation so we can test at runtime whether we need to handle it in a special way. Another aspect here is garbage collection. So that is, uh, so th this sort of, system generates garbage like crazy. So you have to have an effective garbage collector to handle it. So to give you an idea of what, we, what we've done or how we describe the work in this paper, or the evaluation of this paper. So one part is correctness. And by that, I basically mean, if we add virtualization, do we change the behavior at all, right? So if we virtualize and we just replace uh, everything um, in the program using just standard x86 or standard IEEE floating point, do we get exactly the same result? So we do, right? It's not a proof of anything, but it suggests that we're on the right track. So the other thing we do is we look at uh, slowdown and the cost of slowdown. And by the way, these are the benchmarks that we kind of look at and we are trying to shoot for applications. So the biggest thing that we do right now is Enzo, which is relatively large, um, but certainly not at the level of like CDSM. And everything I'm gonna describe here is using 200-bit MPFR as the alternative. And again, the slowdown here is ginormous, right? This is a towards paper, we're in progress. So remember that the cost of um, the, the overhead involved here only is incurred when we trap into the FPVM and, emu and emulate the instruction. So now we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about a detailed breakdown of the cost of an average emulated instruction. So I realize this is a kind of a busy graph, but we're gonna spend a little bit of time on it. So. Vertical axis, you're basically seeing different benchmarks, a subset of the ones I mentioned before. Horizontal axis, you're seeing the number of cycles it takes to handle such an average emulated instruction within, this, uh, within that benchmark. And then we break down each stack bar is broken down into different components. Many of the components are basically near to zero, so you can pretty much ignore them. And now I'm gonna talk about like specific components that matter. So first of all, the beige component here, this is the actual useful work. So this is the time spent in MPFR and the time spent in the instruction emulator, which are not quite divisible in, in our setup. So say this is 50%, you know, what we, what we want to get rid of and 50% in MPFR, right? But that's the useful work and notice that it's dominated by these other components. So what are these other components? So one is the cost of the hardware delivering the trap into the kernel. So this takes about a thousand cycles. So when an instruction faults, it's a thousand cycles before you get to the first instruction in the kernel. Even a highly optimized kernel like ours, although these numbers are for Linux. 
Um, so that cost could be eliminated by changes that we described in the paper. So another major cost is that our system is implemented at user level. So that means that the, the exception or trap that's happening at the hardware level and delivered to the kernel, the kernel has to deliver to us as a signal. And this is the cost of a signal delivery to us and to user land. So this is, of course, gigantic. Now, if we took FPVM and we implemented it, say, as a Linux kernel module, this would be entirely eliminated. So this is not a particularly hard cost to, get, uh, to remove. It's just you know, a matter of pretty significant engineering, but engineering. Um, and here in gray, this is the amortized cost of garbage collection. So there's room for improvement. We have a pretty simple algorithm for handling this. This is a highly specialized garbage collection problem. It's not the general garbage collection problem. Um, and then we have these things. Um, and these are the cost of these correctness traps that we injected to handle the fact that the hardware is not fully virtualizable. If the hardware was fully virtualizable, it would not only make FEVM a lot simpler because it would eliminate the static analysis portion, but it would also eliminate these costs, right? And, and by the way, for the most part, when we incur these costs, what we find in the workload is that nothing strange is happening and the original instruction can basically be allowed to execute, all right? So these are things that could be, for, for folks from, from industry here, particularly Intel, AMD, et cetera, if we could fully virtualize the floating point hardware, these costs would be eliminated. So in conclusion, uh, these are conclusions from the paper. So we make an argument for why you would want floating point virtualization. Um, and we define it and we describe, you know, basically with these bullet points here, what we mean. Uh, we, we show a prototype, right, with some promising initial results. And obviously 1000x is not the final result here. Um, we want to get it to more like 1.1x or something, something similar to like a classic virtualization. Um, and we've some shown, we've described some steps toward resolving that overhead problem. So with that, um, I'll just pause. This, this is the gang. So me and my students, basically. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a very cool talk. Welcome. Welcome to the community. I hope that you found a, you know, like a good place to share this, this sort of crazy work with other people who find it deeply interesting. So yeah, um, I'm just going to jump in before I hand it over to Santosh, but I was going to say, what, what do, what do CPUs and kernels think of this idea of just trapping on every single instruction because it's a NAN input? And I was going to say, I assume that somebody doesn't like this. And from your results, indeed, it looks like the kernel doesn't like this very much, but, um, so, uh, so it's a good question. So the uh, kernel perspective, um, signal delivery in a kernel is, is a rare situation. Um, and so it's not optimized that well. Um, there are, and it's also de intended to be general purpose. So we have some work in progress that makes signal delivery um, from Linux kernel uh, specialized that will lower these overheads. Um, there's, but fundamentally, you're talking about a transition from user space to kernel space, um, which is um, expensive. So there are, uh, there is work from Intel, for example, and in the RISC-V um, standard for doing what they call user level interrupts, which basically means you can have an interrupt delivered exactly to the user space, which avoids both the kernel to user space trap and the hardware to kernel trap costs. Um, we, we have no idea yet what the, what the actual measurements of these are, right? They're actually fast, but in principle, they could be much faster. And in fact, what we really like to do here is something we call pipeline interrupt, which is basically a change to the branch predictor, which says when an exception occurs, just jump over here, right? Because we don't actually have to involve the kernel at all, and we don't have to involve any sort of complicated uh, exception um, processing. Um, so, oh, interesting. We have some ideas for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So there, there's another major issue, which maybe you guys are probably more familiar with, which is, uh, which is uh, precise exceptions, right? So, so, so x86, so x86 gives you precise exceptions for floating point. Giving precise exceptions is very hard, um, and to, to get performance out of that. 
imprecise exceptions would make um, building something at PPM tractable, but a lot harder. Um, so imprecise exception basically means the trap would happen in the instruction, but you wouldn't know about it until a few instructions later. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it over to Santos. She seems to have something to say here. So I think this is really interesting work. So the ability to explore multiple formats is like really appealing, right? So one alternative uh, way to accomplish the same thing is with, through shadow execution, right? Like for example, FP debug or grind in some of our own work on FP sanitizer, I've been doing this. So do you have any thoughts on what are the pros and cons of building a FPVM in contrast to shadow execution would be? So keep in mind, so we're more like, I'm more of an OS architecture kind of guy. So this is my approach to things just in general. Um, we did take a approach. Um, we have an approach in, in the compiler as well. We have a, a compiler, uh, we have a, um, a LLVM transform. Um, that's the compiler based approach I mentioned. Um, and of course there are other tools that do it at the binary level. Uh, so one reason why, uh, you know, beyond just, that's kind of my, my approach to things, one reason for this is um, to try to support use cases where it is the binary that is core, right? So, so like if, if somebody's running CESM for real, right, to get a scientific result, um, it's trusted only like a specific binary is trusted on a specific piece of hardware, et cetera, right? And that's, that's the scenario where we'd like to be able to slide in something under it and, and still see, um, see the change. Does that answer your question? That's good, thank you. Yeah, again, thank you so much. It's really cool to see this work. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not the, the most, you know, expert in terms of operating system system level things, but it's it's really cool to see the sort of you know the the inter inter area work being being brought in here. So thank you so much 